Good, and um, I'm Francis von Luchenberg. I'm the scientific lead on the Global Health Network. Um, and thank you for inviting me to talk today. So what we thought was we would, over the next couple of seminars, talk about specific mixed methods research work that we've done, looking particularly really at, at how we did those and how we integrated quantitative and qualitative res results, but also um, thinking a little bit about what the challenges are and reflecting on some of the pitfalls and, you know, the benefits but potential pitfalls of, of doing this kind of work. And so I'm going to talk about uh, the Caprisa 058 uh, Enhanced Adherence Support Program um, for Antiretroviral Therapy in Durban, which was a, a randomized control trial that we did. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about the design so you know what it's about and then go on to talk about um, briefly what the outcomes were and some of the, the challenges. So the outline for the talk will be to talk about the research background and the study design, then why we did do a mixed methods um, research study, and then um, briefly talk about the findings and, and reflect on the challenges and, and then any questions you might have and hopefully we'll have a discussion about the methodology. So obviously HIV AIDS is a huge problem in South Africa and at the time that we decided to do this research work was a point at which um, antiretroviral therapy was just becoming available in South Africa and if you know about um, the history of treatment it was really within a context of quite high skepticism and uh, political resistance to antiretroviral therapy that we started um, to do our work and so there was a high degree of HIV related stigma and skepticism about particularly antiretroviral therapy in uh, treatment of HIV AIDS. So um, we know from uh, other treatment experiences that um, highly active antiretroviral therapy was very effective and it takes HIV disease from, and, um, from being a certain death sentence to something that's very treatable and manageable and in fact um, quite easily done. But adherence has to be adequate and by adequate we usually mean quite high, so much higher than you would um, need for any other, um, for many other treatments. Um, also, in South Africa at the time, this is in, in South Africa is very high TB burden, and um, there's a high burden of co-infection. And um, what happens with uh, immunocompromised patients is TB disease is often indicative of the fact that um, patients are HIV positive. And so people who weren't testing for HIV um, often would, would end up at TB clinics. And when you become sick with TB, it means often there's something affecting your immune system. And it was, a, for us, a really um, easy way to identify not only HIV-positive patients, but HIV-positive patients that would benefit from treatment, because obviously you don't need treatment for HIV if your immune system is still strong. It's only when you start to have... Um, morbidity that you have to think about treatment. And so active TB was seen as a good way to identify patients that would then also need um, concurrent uh, HIV treatment. The guidelines were not um, uh, supportive of concurrent HIV and TB treatment. So the guidelines at that stage were you uh, treat the TB and then um, on conclusion of uh, successful TB treatment move on to treating um, HIV and so we did a lot of work trying to work out well what is the best way to treat this co uh, comorbidity. Right so in terms of the study design um, Caprisa 058 was then a randomized mm -hmm. control trial that we did to test whether intensive individualized motivational counseling was better in these patients who uh, were undergoing TB treatment and the reason for that is that we felt um, TB treatment is quite different um, to antiretroviral therapy. So TB treatment is concluded in a fixed period of time. You're highly adherent for those couple of months. Then when your TB treatment is successful, uh, you know, you don't have to continue taking treatment. Antiretroviral therapy is for life. High adherence is required all the time. Um, quite often the side effects are uh, quite disabling and unpleasant, whereas in TB treatment you, the um, side effects resolve very quickly and people... Are, actually we feel quite well quite quickly. Um, and so before that reason, and because it's complicated to combine these treatments, we thought we would need some sort of individualized motivational counseling. At the time also there wasn't a lot of experience from public sector HIV treatment because uh, it wasn't available in South Africa. And so the concern 
of many funding bodies and people wanting to do HIV treatment was that it was too complicated for African settings. It was too difficult in resource-constrained settings to ensure that adherence would be high. Uh, so the study design was a randomized control trial. Half of the participants were uh, randomized to receive the standard of care. The other half got this enhanced ad adherence counseling that I'll talk about briefly. We recruited our patients from the um, HIV TB clinic, um, and most of the participants were taking part in other studies looking at how best to integrate HIV and TB treatment. This study was initially designed as a quantitative research study um, with a qualitative component thought of as being key to being able to understand the study outcome. And I think that's what happens quite often. And I'll talk a bit about that. Usually there's a quantitative research design and somebody says, well, can we add a qualitative component because it will be really useful in being able to look at the results. And there's some benefit and um, I think some problems with that as well. In terms of the intervention, um, so what we did was when patients became eligible for, our, for uh, antiretroviral therapy, all participants then were scheduled for two standard of care counseling sessions. And these are described as didactic because they're sort of lecture style, um, often done in groups with um, patients coming in and they get told about treatment and what to expect and what's required um, of, of treatment adherence. And um, the sessions could be done, um, up to two could be done on one day. So these first two sessions, sometimes we're done with patients all on one day. There's then a period of time when you schedule patients to initiate treatment, and then they come back uh, to be initiated on treatment. And at that point, we randomized our patients to either receive the final didactic counseling control uh, session or to go into the enhanced adherence program. And the enhanced adherence program then had the first motivational counseling session, followed by four over the course of the first six months of treatment, so um, five in all. Importantly, uh, the motivational intervention was based on the information motivation and behavioral skills model of antiretroviral therapy adherence. And it was designed to identify and address deficits in informational knowledge motivation, personal and social motivation to adhere, as well as the skills needed to be able to take um, medication uh, properly. Uh, and we use motivational interviewing techniques, so instead of telling patients, as they did in the didactic arm, how to adhere, it was all about, well, what might prevent you from taking your medicine at night? What could you do differently? And then patients would give self-motivated um, declarations about the sorts of things they could do to address issues with adherence. So it, it had to be done one-on-one -on -one and it was quite in, intensive. And the other bit about the intervention is we believed it would be providing counselling support at a period of time when patients were actually dealing with issues of uh, medication adherence rather than as um, medication literacy or preparation, which is what the standard mm -hmm. program was. It was about saying, well, once you start is the point at which you actually start to have problems and that's the point at which we should be having the discussion. So just di uh, diagrammatically, um, starting from the left, everybody got the first two sessions of the didactic adherence program when they became um, eligible for antiretroviral therapy. On the day of initiation, uh, participants were uh, randomized either to receive the ongoing adherence motivational support program at the top or the final um, session three of didactic adherence. And then we followed patients up um, in the main study uh, for the primary outcome to nine months, but um, at six months we did um, adherence assessments. At nine months, um, there was the viral load was the primary outcome for the trial, and we followed patients up to 12 months. Um, in terms of quantitative outcomes, so the primary outcome was the proportion of uh, uh, participants with suppressed viral load at nine months, and we followed up to um, 12 months as well. We did adherence count by pill count at six months, um, and then also uh, a secondary outcome was adherence at six months using self-report to just determine which the best uh, methods of measuring adherence were. Um, for qualitative, the qualitative study, um, participants were separately consented and enrolled to take part either in interviews or in focus groups. Um, uh, again, sorry, these were at around nine months uh, post-initiation of treatment. Um, and the method generally was to use an interview schema to check on the one hand, um, whether participants were talking about strategies related to the intensive uh, motivational counseling, but also to understand patients' lived experience of adherence and, and to try and identify new and novel things about adherence that, that we couldn't um, determine 
a priori. So what was the rationale? Well, we knew that um, the quantitative study would very efficiently tell us uh, what was happening, whether or not patients had suppressed viral load was an incredibly important clinical outcome. It was objectively measured, and so it had uh, a lot of importance in terms of um, um, having a clinically meaningful and supportable and defensible outcome for clinicians who would have to make the decision really about whether or not this additional resource uh, was necessary or useful. We did want to put in a qualitative study, and I think this is what often happens is once you know that uh, the two groups uh, have different levels of suppressed viral load, why is that? What is it about the intervention? So it's a very resource-intensive uh, motivational counseling intervention. How does it really have an, an impact on uh, patient behavior? What aspects of it are useful? Potentially huge bits of it might not be that useful. And so obviously the best way to find out about what how patients are able to adhere to the treatment is to, to talk to them um, and to find out how they go about uh, enacting adherence behaviors. I think it's also quite useful in talk therapies or counseling interventions because what you're interested in is private behavior, thoughts, attitudes, and so to talk to participants is the way in which you elicit those, uh, those data. Just in terms of recruitment, um, the study was done quite a while back between 2007 2009. There were just under 300 um, participants enrolled, uh, and they were fairly well matched at baseline with regard to important factors like demographic, CD4 count, etc. 53% of the participants in the trial were concurrently receiving TB treatment, and a further 26% uh, had uh, completed within four weeks of initiation. So the vast majority of participants on this trial had experience of or were currently experiencing TB treatment. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about that, except to say that um, we excluded participants who died within three months from the analysis because it was uh, thought to be too soon for any adherence intervention to ha um, have an impact. And we did do analysis that looked at um, uh, participants who had died before nine months, but after three months, and counted them as treatment failures. And we also tracked uh, participants who were lost, withdrawn, or in, in any ways lost to the program, and counted them as failures also in the full analysis, as they were failures of the treatment program. So the adherence is both to get you to take your medicine, but also to make sure that you stay in the treatment uh, program. Just in terms of quantitative results, um, we found very high levels of adherence in both uh, treatment arms, and in fact, looking just at those participants who were in the study and provided viral load outcomes, uh, around 90% of participants in each arm uh, were able to uh, or had suppressed uh, viral load at, at nine months, and it wasn't much different at, at 12 months. So, obviously, the um, longer you follow participants, the more opportunities there are for uh, viral load failure. And in terms of uh, adherence, again, also very high levels around. Um, uh, just over 80% in, in both arms. And so this was very unexpected. It certainly um, uh, was surprising to us that there was no significant um, association with this intensive, uh, individualized, one-on-one -on -one, uh, motivational counseling, um, even when you account for everybody who's lost and you do a whole um, cohort analysis, you, you have the same uh, sort of outcome. So, uh, and I think important just to to note here also is that the, um, one of the problems with this, this was that um, treatment outcomes were good in the control arm, which wasn't really what we expected, but that's good for patients, not good for if you're trying to assess uh, an intervention. But that says something. It says something about treatment in this context. And the way we were able to say more about that was to look at the, um, the qualitative data. And if we hadn't collected these data, we wouldn't really know why it was so easy for these uh, participants to adhere in a context uh, um, in which they really shouldn't have been able to. And so um, when we looked at the qualitative data and uh, thought more about um, participants' experiences uh, in this uh, treatment program, um, participants were very positive about uh, their treatment experiences and the ease with which they were able to adhere. And we extracted from the qualitative data key themes around um, antiretroviral therapy is for life, routine remembering, 
helping others and good clinics, good doctors. And I don't want to talk about the results so much now because this is more about the methods. But what was clear is that um, because of recent experiences of mortality in communities and morbidity, uh, and then seeing uh, very quickly the improvement in people who went on to treatment, patients really quickly picked up that this was for life in both meanings of the word. Um, and this um, example here, I've noticed how beautiful I've become after taking these tablets. I don't think I will ever stop taking them. I was sick. I was very sick. I'm not exaggerating. I was raised from the dead. And a lot of patients talked about either themselves or somebody else being raised from the dead or this how beautiful I've become. So people were used to seeing a lot of sickness and illness in their communities and then um, noticed and talked about the huge change that um, treatment had brought. And so motivation was incredibly high. And it, it turns out that these patients probably don't need all of the additional support that um, we had an, anticipated. So just in conclusion about the trial, uh, treatment outcomes were very high in both groups. And so it was very hard to show impact of the intervention. Perhaps if we had identified patients at risk for adherence or had um, selected patients who were battling, um, we would have uh, been able to show that uh, the intervention was better than the control. Of course, it would be very difficult in that um, uh, trial design to sort of say, well, we just continue with the standard of care in patients we know aren't doing well, and we're now just going to focus all of this additional effort on um, a subgroup of those, those patients. Um, we do know that this treatment program specifically did have better outcomes than other regional treatment programs. Uh, again, part of that was because of success on TB treatment. So rather than TB treatment being a barrier to success on antiretroviral therapy, the um, experience of success on TB treatment seemed to uh, motivate and reinforce drug-taking behaviors. We did think that uh, the motivation was very high due to experiences of mortality and morbidity and the change that um, treatment brought about, but also difficulty in access. So Patients talked a lot about, um, if I mess up here, that's my life is gone. I won't be able to get treatment anywhere else if I kind of get kicked off this program. So patients were really highly motivated um, to stay in a program and to, to uh, do well. And we got all of that from the, the qualitative results, and we can understand much better what the lived experiences of patients are. If we hadn't done the qualitative portion of the trial, um, we would have very little to say other than patients didn't seem to need this additional um, support. So just in terms of reflection on this pro process, um, qualitative data obviously are very uh, useful and appropriate for behavioral interventions to understand uh, why patients behave in a certain way and how they perceive behavioral interventions. It's slightly different when it's a vaccine and you're administering it in a clinic and you give a one-dose vaccine, you send somebody off. So qualitative data do have a very particular role, I think, in health research. It's hard for patients to talk about difficulties in a clinic where they're receiving treatment. And I think that's something that uh, we also realized. And we really had to coax patients into being critical of the services provided. And when you do qualitative research, I think that's a particular challenge. We included focus groups for that reason in the hope that um, participants in focus groups would be able to be more critical. They talk about in the third person rather than themselves, but even then, uh, very little was said. It's very hard, and it's much harder than you think, to do iterative data collection in a qualitative study, particularly if you're working in a language that you're not doing the analysis in. So. One of our experiences on this was our intention was to do, sort of do a focus group, look at it, go back, modify the interview guides, think about training the um, person who was collecting the data to, to ask about different things. But it, it just ended up being impossible to do the interviews and focus groups, the transcription, the translation, and then look at it before we had to be back in the clinic doing more of them. And so that's something that um, it, I think you have to think about if you're doing this sort of work. Um, the other issue is, uh, so motivational factors might fade. Um, and so if you don't know what the motivational factors are that are affecting adherence behavior, so if you did a quantitative study, you might say right now patients are adherent and there's nothing needed in this treatment program. But what, what you could say is, well, if you did qualitative uh, data collection, you would understand what the motivating factors are and you could... Um, perhaps say something about how 
uh, long those are likely to have an effect. So we know, for example, there's probably going to be a point at which the effect of mortality and morbidity is going to wear off because people won't have that direct experience anymore of illness and of death. So could you anticipate that adherence motivation may drop over time? So the other problem is, even though you do all of this work to integrate your data collection and your study design, when it comes to publication, we found it impossible to integrate publication. And so within the word limits of your standard scientific paper, it just became too difficult to have both the quantitative outcomes and the qualitative outcomes in one paper. So it's written up, and of course the one that went first is the quantitative results because those that are the ones that have the punch and, um, and we're still following up now um, with qualitative data. So the best of intentions, and I'd be interested to see how other people have um, negotiated this, but it, the way scientific publication works with word limits and focus and um, all the rest, it becomes difficult to, to put them together. Um, the other thing is qualitative data collection and analysis is much more resource uh, intensive and time consuming. And so um, it can be quite difficult when you're designing a trial to be able to sell it to clinicians and policy makers. So I think you have to work very hard at being able to um, do that. So what you hear often is a clinician will say, but if you're measuring suppressed viral load, why do you need to measure anything else? Because if I'm providing treatment, that's all I need to know. And once you've done that, what does it matter why people are doing something? So it, it does take a lot of, of selling. The other little thing just to think about when you're doing talking to patients is it's very hard to do a study on something where the thing you're talking about is the thing you're trying to change. So if you are, for example, measuring suppressed viral load in your trial, you can be fairly sure if you're just measuring that it's not going to impact on the behavior. But if you're talking about or asking about adherence all the time, you likely to impact on patient behavior. And I think that's common in satisfaction surveys and discussing the way people interact with the healthcare system. So qualitative data have this particular aspect where you modify behavior much more through what you measure and how you interact um, with participants or patients. So just to finish up, um, that's the quantitative paper that's published um, and some other uh, papers that I found quite useful um, in, in doing this work and you may find interesting. And just to say that uh, at the Global Health Network, we've um, started to put up the uh, mixed mm. methods seminars online so that if you want to access these and comment about them or uh, share experiences, please visit the website. And I've put the short link to the methods site above and then the long link below. So just in terms of that, uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Um, and I'll take any questions you, you might have. But also, I think we need to think a bit about um, when you're trying to integrate qualitative and quantitative data in one study design, what are the roles of the various types of evidence? Um, and when can you use one to support the other? Um, and it's a common criticism of qualitative data that you're trying to use it to explain something in quantitative data when the two designs aren't properly aligned to do that. So you might have a quantitative result you can't explain, and then you've talked to patients, but you haven't thought enough about, is what I'm talking to the patients about part of the pathway to my quantitative outcome? Otherwise, they can sometimes be quite separate, and so patients may talk about things that are very different to the proposed or the pathway that you're actually interested in. And so it does take a bit of aligning. And so when is this possible, and when is it um, less feasible? And when is it likely to fail? So when is integration of the quantitative qualitative data um, likely to be difficult to, to mesh? Great. Thank you.